today I plan on talking about 61850, and hopefully this is a primer to whet your appetites on 61850. Before we do that, let me introduce myself to you. I lead the team of commercial application engineers for GE Grid Automation in North America. So that means I lead the team of TAEs. I joined GE in 2008. Prior to GE, I worked at uh, TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, and uh, Mesa Associates. To sort of put 61850 into perspective, one of the things that I'll talk about is goose messaging today. And in my history, the first time I ever passed a goose message from a relay to another relay, from an IED to an IED, it was in the fall of the year 2000. So it's nearly 20 years, well, almost 20 years ago this fall when I first uh, passed Goose Messages. And since that time, I've been involved with several projects that use 61850, as well as troubleshooting and helping our customers with 61850 applications. So with that said, let's talk about what I intend to cover today. So at the end of the day, hopefully we have a good understanding of what 61850 is. Well, I'll talk also about the data model and how the data, data model is the backbone that describes 61850 and helps 61850 achieve interoperability as well as the self-descriptive nature of the standard. We'll talk about the publisher subscriber protocol, which is a little bit different protocol than what we normally think about when we talk, uh, talk about protocols. And the publisher subscriber protocol will be very important for both sample values and goose messaging, which we'll talk about. And then we'll also talk about process bus and station bus. And we'll end with a few conclusions and then Hopefully, I save about 10 to 15 minutes to address any questions that you guys raise in the question bar at the bottom. Okay, so let's jump in and talk about what 61850 is. So one of the first things that I always say is that 61850 is not a protocol. And you'll often hear people say, 61850 protocol, and they'll describe it as a protocol, a, a communications protocol between you know, two devices. 61850 is a standard. It is a standard, and inside of that standard, we define some protocols. We define protocols like MMS, sample values, and goose messaging, but it is much more than just the protocols. So the, 61850, at its heart, is a way to model the substation, both the primary and the secondary equipment, and then defines the communications between devices and substations so that we can communicate that modeled substation. And so on top of that, though, the standard defines some of the engineering processes and the mythologies that we will use for substation automation functions. The standard uses a modular approach to determine how we expand the system and grow the system. And it also is applicable to most substation control and monitoring functions. So 61850, IEC 61850, it's a part of the IEC standards. It's the first, uh, you know, it's been evolving since 1997. The Goose messaging, to, in full disclosure, the goose messaging that I sent in the fall of 2000 in a project in the actual substation, that wasn't 61850 goose, that was UCA goose. So UCA goose was the forerunner of 61850, IEC 61850, uh, and IEC 61850 has had much more acceptance than UCA ever did and has become the standard. So UCA, the UCA doesn't really exist as we knew it back in those days. But this standard was developed from several domain experts who wanted to develop a way to achieve this interoperability, uh, to <clears throat> achieve interoperability, and to reduce some of the wiring in the substation and make implementing of substation projects faster and easier, and expansion of those projects faster and easier. 
and to do that in a very standard way. So far, you know, as we look at what has been accepted and what hasn't been accepted inside of the 61850 standard, the thing that has gained the most acceptance by far is the use of goose messaging. Now, I'll talk about goose messaging in a few moments, but goose messaging is basically a mechanism to send a peer-to-peer -peer message from one IED to another IED. And in my IED, IED in our context stands for Intelligent Electronic Device. And uh, in my context, that typically means a protective relay. So the 61850 standard is basically broken into 10 basic chapters, or 10 parts. I like to refer to them as chapters, but in reality, they, I, the standard refers to itself in parts. And so part one through three are basically the introduction and glossary and some of the general requirements. Now, those three parts lay the foundation and the core for interoperability. Because if we adhere to the standard, then all the manufacturer's devices will basically be implemented the same. So those, those lay the foundation. Part four describes system and project management. So this gives guidelines on tendering and project management. When we get into part five, this is when we get into some of the communications requirements. Typically, the communication requirements in the physical architecture side are Ethernet. It can be a point-to-point -point Ethernet, or it can be a switched, uh, switched Ethernet. But communicate, most of the protocols that are described in this standard are running on Ethernet. And then part six is where we get into some of the interest, really interesting things where we describe a configuration language. And that configuration language is the core of interoperability. It's also the core of the self-descriptive nature of 61850. So that part of the chapter describes some of the, some of the tools that you would use, how the file structure should exist in, from the IEDs and how you can manipulate them and things like that. Part seven is where the communication model exists. So this is where the data model exists and the services model exists. And obviously as we get, as, as we get deeper into the standard, it becomes more interested. But in the communications model and the data model, that's where we start to describe things like logical nodes, which I'll talk about in a few slides. And then in Chapter 8, this is where we get into mapping for MMS as well as Goose Messaging. Protocol that's sort of described in Chapter 8 is Goose Messaging, and again, that is the peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Chapter 9, Chapter 9 deals with mapping for point-to-point -point connections as well as switched connections for process bus and sample values. So a lot of times I will think of Chapter 8 as station bus, Chapter 9 as process bus. We'll talk about what those two different things mean in a few more slides. But process bus at this point is a mechanism for us to digitize the, the values at the primary equipment and then publish those values to a network so that the IEDs can then subscribe to those values and turn those values into operating quantities. And then the last chapter, part 10, is testing. And since we are in a utility environment a lot of times, we're in an environment where we're relying on our IEDs to provide critical infrastructure protection, testing will always be important. And testing can be done in a way that makes sense and makes life easier inside of 61850. So chapter nine largely addresses how you test and how you make things easier testing. Okay, so as I sort of alluded to, there are three basic communication protocols that are described in my mind. I, describe, I think of this as three basic protocols 
that the standard defines and calls out. The first one of these is the client-server communication. And client-server uses MMS. So this is a protocol that, um, that it uses. Now, one of the unique things about MMS is that it is a TCP IP protocol. So when we talk about TCP IP, it means that the, uh, that the IP address is important, that we can route things based on that IP address, and that we can route the messages. Client server, basically, the IED, or the protective relay, would act as a server to data where the station HMI or a substation gateway would act as a client being served data. The other protocol that I mentioned is GOOSE messaging. Now, <clears throat> GOOSE stands for Generic Object-Oriented Substation Event. And GOOSE messaging is a way to send a message from an IED to another IED. And this is, like I said earlier, this is the most accepted form of 61850. This is the most often used thing. So a couple of things to point out here. Uh, you can send an analog goose message. GE's relays send analog goose messages. And so these could be things like power values, things of that nature. Uh, in a load shedding scheme, that is very valuable. But most of the goose messages that I see going from one IED to another are digital states. And so these could be things in a transmission substation. These could be things like broker failure initiate or reclose initiate, where you've had one IED that caused a trip, but you need to send a control message to initiate something else in another IED. Inside of a distribution application, what I typically see is a zone selective interlocking where one of the IEDs will, a downstream IED will send a goose message to an upstream device to block a non coordinating element so that they can have, achieve faster tripping times. Sample values is the third thing I show up there. And sample values, as I mentioned earlier, this exists on the process bus, and I might use the word process bus interchangeably with sample values. That's incorrect on my part because process bus is the physical architecture, and it can have more than just sample values on there. But sample values, what I'm going to do is I'm going to digitize the, 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 the signals, the currents and the voltages at the primary equipment, which means at the breaker, at the transformer. And then I'm going to publish those values to a process bus network. The IED can then subscribe to those values and turn those values into a magnitude and an angle and apply those to the comparators for protection or other functions. One of the things I should point out on this slide also is if you look at the goose messages and the sample values that I show there, they go straight down to the Ethernet link layer and sort of bypass the TCP and IP layer. So both of those, both of those two protocols don't really use TCP IP. And what that means is, is to us is that those messages don't make it through a router. Those messages go to a router to die. So unless we intentionally do some things like bridge the router over and turn it into more of a switch type thing, goose messages and sampled values don't get routed, which, <coughs> which make management of those messages a little bit easier. OK, so I talked about this concept of a data model. Let's explore that a little bit. So a lot of times when we talk about 61850, we will talk about this concept of a logical node. And a logical node is really a mechanism that lets us model the substation. But it lets us model the substation in a standard format 
and, a, and doing that in the standard format allows us to achieve some interoperability between devices, and it also allows us to achieve this self-descriptive nature of 61850, where we can describe how the substation is built from the IED itself. And so the way that this is really instantiated, or the way that this is built, is there are functions that are defined as logical nodes. Now the logical node itself will be housed inside of a physical device and a logical device. So in most instances, the logical device is the IED, the protective relay. This might be something in the GE world, like a D60 relay. And then inside of that G60 relay is a data model that models the breaker, for example, or a metering coin. So in this slide, logical node 1, LN1, which is the darker green color, is labeled XCBR. And so XCBR is the logical node for a circuit breaker. And so what this is really doing is modeling that circuit breaker. Now, if I think about a circuit breaker, there are things that I'm interested in that circuit breaker. The most important thing that I'm interested in that circuit breaker is what is its current position, either opened or closed. So there are data classes like position, which is labeled POS there. And then there is actual data. So STV, is, I've always called that status value, but STV would be the position, there would be a position, either open or closed, in that data. I also show a Q in the, uh, in the yellow there, and Q, in this case, stands for quality. And so quality inside of the 61850 world is where I can set testing things. So there is a test bit and a simulation bit that I can set inside of that quality bit that, and those two bits will describe how, how other devices should treat that information. So, for example, if I want to block tripping from other devices, I might set the device that it's getting information from into test mode. And when I want to signal to the other devices that I'm simulating data, I would set the simulation bit. Likewise, the other logical node that I show there is an MMXU. And an MMXU is a metering measuring unit. So what I'm showing there is current, phase A and phase B. And the, this, this concept of logical nodes, it's the backbone of the self-descriptive nature of 61850. So if we agree on the standard, then we implement logical nodes in the same way. Then setup tools and devices can interoperate. So there are multiple logical nodes. I'll talk about some of them in a few moments. But what this means is, is once I've instantiated this logical node for the breaker position, other devices can know how to interpret that and know that that is the breaker position. Other devices that I send either a goose message to or that are inter are are being served data to from a client relay or a client IED. Okay, so the chapter seven in 61850 describes some of these logical nodes that we have to instantiate. Now, I just mentioned that X, and we see X over on the right side there, that's a switch gear. So XCBR is a switch gear things that it would be interested in is position. X, the SWI is typically a switch, like an MOD. MMXU I also showed on the previous slide, and again, it's on the right up at the top, and that is a metering and measuring logical node. That's where I will do things like, uh, like provide currents and voltages. Over on the left side, we can start to see some other logical nodes. If a logical node starts with a P, like PTOC, which I'm going to probably call PTOC, 
during this presentation, that's a protective element. So PTOC stands for protection time overcurrent. PIOC is protection instantaneous overcurrent. And again, those logical nodes will have uh, data and uh, data associated with them like quality bits, also the status value bits. Also, there's some control logical nodes like CSWI. A lot of times we run into the GGIO, which is a generic logical node. But these are the logical nodes, and what I can do is these logical nodes help me to build a model of the substation that I can then start to communicate to other devices. So the way that I sort of build that model is I will have functions inside of my IED or my relay like XCBR, or like circuit breaker. And so the relay needs to know how to build the model of the substation and to know, you know when the breaker is in whatever position. So if I have a 52A, an auxiliary contact from the breaker wired to the relay, I can tell the relay things about that 52A contact based on the breaker control element that is in the relay or the IED. And it will build sort of a model. And based on that model, then it will instantiate a logical node. So it will instantiate a logical node like XCBR, which is the breaker logical node. And then it will have data associated with the position of the circuit breaker, either opened or closed. And again, what this lets me do is this lets me start to build a model of the substation. So I can have circuit breaker logical nodes with the XCBR, I can have power transformer logical nodes, I can have uh, instrument transformer logical nodes with the TCR and TYTR. And then inside the substation itself, I can have logical nodes associated with protective elements like protection differential, protection distance, protection time overcurrent, and protection instantaneous overcurrent. And so what this model does then for me is it lets me build a model of my power system inside of my IEDs, and then I can start to use that modeled information to communicate that to other devices that need to know need to know the status of equipment. So one of the key mechanisms that's a little bit different is the publisher subscriber suite of protocols. And this is sort of unique inside of 61850. And sort of the way that I like to think of this is it's as a publisher subscriber protocol, it's a lot like a newspaper. Uh, I, I think we will probably get to the point where I will have to explain to people when I'm giving this presentation what a newspaper was. I hope we're not exactly to that point yet, but we're probably pretty close. But if we think about a newspaper, and if I uh, if I uh, if I subscribe to the newspaper, that newspaper gets thrown on my doorstep every morning. In a similar way, what happens in a in a publisher subscriber type scenario inside of 61850, if a device like an, an IED, either a relay or a merging unit, whatever the IED is, if it's publishing, if it's publishing a message, it sends that message out to the network. And this will be a multicast message. And as a multicast message, it will go out every single port on an Ethernet switch that it hits, unless we intentionally do some things on that switch to control the flow of traffic. Now, we can do some things like MAC address filtering and DLAN filtering that will control the flow of the traffic on the internet network on our on our uh, switched Ethernet network on our switch our Ethernet switch, but if we don't do anything, it'll go out every single uh, every single port. 
Now, the devices that are interested then in those messages, the devices that are interested in those messages can choose to subscribe to it. So in reality, inside of a Goose message, for example, there's a header and, a da and the data. And if a device is subscribing to the message, it will recognize the content of that header and say, hey, this is a message that I'm interested in. And then it can go to the data that's in the message and pick the actual things that it's interested in uh, for status. So again, this is the uh, mechanism that we use for Goose messaging, this publisher subscribing protocol. It's also what we use for process books. Okay, the way that we sort of build the, the, the publisher subscriber protocol and the way that we sort of build this 461850 is with this concept of data sets. So on the left over here, we'll, you can see the logical device. So the logical device would be the IED itself, the protective relay. There are logical nodes inside of the device like protection time overcurrent, PTOC on the bottom. And then there's particular attributes to PTOC. Like for example, has it operated? What's the status value? Is it operated? Has it picked up? Those sort of attributes. And we can assign those attributes from the logical node to data sets. Once we assign them into a data set, it can then be instantiated into other logical devices and other logical nodes. So what ends up happening is, is we, we instantiate these uh, these data sets into control blocks that can then be published to the network and the network can see it. Sort of the way I, I've described this in the form of a header and data. Uh, that is the way that I prefer to, to think of this in that the data will be the attributes for a logical node that I have built into a report block and a um, into a data set or a report. Okay. So with that primer on the publisher subscriber protocol, let's talk about process bus and station bus. So <clears throat> many times this is the way we think of a 61850 substation. There's a station bus, bus up at the top and a process bus down at the bottom. Now, the station bus is going to have IEDs connected to it. Maybe these are protective relays and other devices. It can also be where I have my uh, operator workplace. I can have a gateway. I can also have my my uh, substation HMI. Now on the station bus, we can pass Goose messages from one IED to another. So this might be where I send messages like rec uh, reclose initiate or break or failure initiate. Down on the process bus, down on the process bus is where I'm going to publish my sample values from process interface units. Also, it will be important on the process bus to be able to pass Goose messages because those process, inter I'll define what process interface units are in just a minute in a couple more slides, but down the, it, it will be important for the, those process interface units will, will publish the sample values, but they'll also control the primary equipment. So those process interface units are going to be located at the primary equipment in the breaker, for example. And so they're going to have CTs wired to them from the breaker. They're going to publish sample values from those CTs, but then they're also going to control the breaker. So trip and close commands, for example, are going to come from the protective relay. And those are going to come in the form of a goose message. So the process inter interface unit should be able to publish sample values to the network, and it should also be able to publish as well as subscribe to Goose messaging, because it'll need to subscribe to the Goose messages to trip and close the breaker when commanded to do so by the 
AD, but it'll also need to publish the status of the broker to that same network, and it'll do that via Goose Messages. Now, one of the questions that I got uh, in the pre-questions prior to the event was, should the process bus and the station bus be separate buses, or should they be all one thing? And I feel very passionately that they should be separate networks. And so you're getting into my opinion at this point rather than what the standard says. So be forewarned, I'm giving you my opinion, and my opinion is that process bus and station bus should be separate networks. Not only that, but I also feel sort of strongly that what we should that that rather than the way that I show this now with goose messaging on the station bus, I feel strongly that we should do all of our goose messaging on the process bus. So even if we need to send a reclose initiate or a breaker failure initiate from one IED to another, there's no reason we have to do that on the process bus. I mean, excuse me, there's no reason we have to do that on the station bus. We could do that on the process bus. And the reason I like, the reason I feel so passionately about that is that what that does for me is if I put all my goose messages and all of my sample values onto the process bus and I don't have any goose messages on the station bus, then that lets me sort of maintain the process bus as the protection and control network. In other words, I don't wouldn't have necessarily need or have communication guys in my process bus or SCADA guys in my process bus. They could stay up into the station bus. And uh, from my perspective and from my own experience, that works out better. Uh, otherwise, sometimes maintenance activities happen on a particular switch, and that can if 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 that's not expected, those maintenance activities can cause some problems. So that's something I feel passionately about. But again, that's my opinion rather than the way the world has to be. Okay. So if we look at the station bus and the process bus, the station bus, and we and we do this in the way that I just described, what this does for us is this lets us this lets us have the station bus inside of the control room and the process bus can extend out into the yard. So what that does for us is that does some, uh, that this goes to another point that I would make around not having the station bus and the process bus interconnected is that everything that's going to be on the process bus and then be at the Ethernet link layer, goose messaging and sample values, and I don't really have a mechanism or I don't really have a physical connection to the station bus which goes outside of my control building. So this lets me sort of control my security requirements a little bit better. That's another thing that I feel very passionate about uh, keeping those two separate and keeping the traffic isolated on the two. Uh, the only downside to doing this, as I described, is that I don't have engineering access then to my process bus. But in reality, once we have commissioned the station and put it into service, the, there is very little that I would need engineering access. There's very few instances that I would need engineering access to my merging units or my process interface units that are on my process bus. Okay, so let's talk about goose messaging and sort of the application structure of goose messaging. So, goose messaging can be a very fast mechanism to get a message from a relay to from one IED to another IED. And in fact, you can ha it depends on the, the, the type of message, but to meet the standard, if it is a, type, a trip and close command, fast goose messaging, it has to be less than three milliseconds to receive the message or to publish the message to the network. 
So to sort of put that into perspective, ah, so if one of the things about the goose messaging, though, is that to achieve this really fast operate speed is there isn't sort of a check back mechanism. So in a lot of protocols, there's a mech mechanism where you when, you when you send a message, there is a subsequent message that comes that says, yes, I did receive that message. That does not exist inside of Goose messaging. And so the way that that security and dependability is achieved through Goose messaging is that it just publishes that message, and then there is a retransmission and there's a retransmission mechanism for the goose message. So typically goose messages are sent on a heartbeat interval. So that heartbeat interval can be something like every second, which means they send the status, send the goose message every second, and then immediately upon a state change, it will send the goose message of that state change, and then it will resend, like I'm showing on the screen here. It will resend several times, in a short succession until it starts to slow down out to the heartbeat interval of the device or of the message. To sort of describe how fast these messages can come, if I compare this to a traditional hardwired contact on a relay, there, if I am closing an output contact on one, one IED, and that output is wired to the input on another IED. Typically, since I'm closing an output contact, that takes some time. So that might take as much as four milliseconds. So it takes me four milliseconds to close the output contact. It's not a solid state output contact, it's about that same time. The debounce time on the receiving device, so this is a, a timer to make certain that the, uh, that the input is asserted, is usually around four milliseconds also. That looks like about eight milliseconds for a message that is hardwired to, get, to go from one device to another device. With goose messaging, I can do that in about three milliseconds. So goose messaging, if it's a fast goose message, is faster than the traditional hardwired mechanism. The other nice thing about goose messaging is since I'm sending that heartbeat, if I don't receive that heartbeat, I know that I've had a communications failure or the remote device is offline, and I can raise an alarm for that. In a non-failsafe uh, output contact scenario, I don't have that mechanism and don't know that the remote device is offline or not functioning correctly or that my wires are cut, which is another feature of Goose messaging. It's more secure and it's faster. Okay, so let's talk about the last sort of thing that I on my agenda is sample values. So <clears throat> inside of sample values, there are three devices, and I'm sorry, but I will often use two of these devices interchangeably. So one of the devices is a merging unit. And a merging unit is a device that is at the primary equipment that publishes sample values to a network. So it does this using Chapter 9 of 61850. That's a merging unit. A remote I.O. device, a remote input and output device, is a device that publishes Goose messages and can subscribe to Goose messages. And it's, again, at the primary equipment. Now, I often use the word merging unit interchangeably with process interface unit. And probably the reason I do that is because all of the, all of the devices that I deal with, all of uh, GE's process interface units, uh, we, we don't have a merging unit up by itself or remote I.O. by itself. We have process interface units. So, our MU320, our BRIC solution, both of those, I, I often call those merging units, but they're actually process interface units. And what a process interface unit is, is it will publish those sample values to a network, but then it will also subscribe and publish Goose messages so that it can receive commands and control breakers and also give the status of those devices as well. 
So here's an example of one of our first merging units, the BRIC solution. So the, the BRIC was a process interface unit. I warned you that I would do that. I just used those interchangeably. But the BRIC is a process interface unit, and it, it has been around longer than I have been around in GE. So I joined GE in 2008 in August, and we uh, GE released the BRIC in June of that same year. Now, the BRIC is a, an implementation of 61850 process bus. It's a point-to-point -point solution. And when I say that it's a, the, our other solution can be a switched Ethernet process bus solution, and that's the MU320. But here's an example of some of the mounting of the brick. So this is the brick is a hardened device that can be mounted outdoor. Um, in the middle picture, it's mounted inside of a cabinet. And then in a retrofit application on the picture on the right is are some bricks that were uh, that were mounted inside in sort of a retrofit application. Now, <clears throat> with both the BRIC and the MU320, the way that the merging unit actually operates, I've heard this described as putting the back of the relay closer to the primary equipment. That's sort of true. Um, with some nuanced differences. So if we look at the traditional microprocessor-based relay at the top and the merging unit down at the bottom, both of them will have inputs from CTs and VTs, and there'll be some input transformers. They'll both have some analog filters to filter out noise and, and things like that. And then there will be an A to D converter and a DSP. Now, in the merging unit, at that point, after the DSP and after the ADD converter, the device is publishing those sample values to the network. So it's going to publish, um, it's going to publish the sample values to the network. Now, inside of a relay, what happens after the digital filter? I mean, after the ADD converter is a digital filter and a magnitude estimator. It's going to turn those sample values into a magnitude and an angle. So the, the same thing is going to happen to the, at the devices that are subscribing to these sample values that are being published to the network. So the MU320, for example, supports the 9-2 LE implementation of process bus. And so it's publishing sample values at a rate of 80 samples per cycle. And then the subscribing devices are then going to subscribe to those 80 samples per cycle. They're going to run those through a digital filter, and then they're going to do a magnitude estimator at that device. And that magnitude estimator is going to turn it into a magnitude and angle, which can then be placed against comparators to operate. Now, a, a question that often occurs is, what, does sample values, does it slow down the protection system? And the answer to that is somewhat yes. So there is some delay associated with publishing and subscribing and getting these sample values through the network. Typically, though, what we see is, is that delay is sort of minimal, it's probably less than four milliseconds. So to put this in perspective, if we use if we use a solid state output contact on the merging unit to trip with, the the amount of delay that we introduce with sample values is washed out or, or eliminated because of the faster operate time. So it's typically fairly small. So, in conclusion, I would say that 61850 is a standard. It's not a protocol. Uh, this standard that we describe, it does define protocols, and some of those protocols are things like goose messaging, MMS, and sample values. One of the nice things about 
850 is the interoperability and the speed of design, which is at the heart of the standard. And the self-descriptive nature, 61850, unlocks the value of the standard and makes it easier to implement and uh, interoperable. Okay. Uh, one of the questions that I got uh, before the, uh, the session was, how is the communication different and beneficial from other modes? And I, I would say that um, if I compare if I compare 61850 to something like DNP, uh, if I compare it to DNP, then the self-descriptive nature makes it a lot easier uh, than building a DNP points list. I can ask the relay basically to give me an, its XML file and then just choose the values that I'm interested in, whereas you know, I've got to pass around an Excel spreadsheet that shows the points list for uh, DNP mapping. You know, the other thing that is different is in the Goose messaging, for example, is this publisher-subscriber protocol. So since it's publisher-subscriber, I can send a message to a multiple relays at the same time. All I have to be is, is really interested in that, uh, in that message. Uh, one, of the, <laughs> one of the questions I got was, who said that the, uh, that the uh, process bus and station bus can be connected? Uh, like I said, that's not, I don't know who said that, but I've, had, I've, I've talked to people that like that implementation, that want to do things that way. Again, I don't think that is a proper way to do that. So what application in distribution, in distribution is 61850 best suited? So as I talked about reclose initiate and breaker failure initiate, I sort of glossed over, you know, those are transmission applications and what's the best applications in distribution? And I'll say that the um, the substation that I worked on 20 years ago, where I first implemented Goose Messages, that was a distribution substation. What we were using Goose Messaging for there was a zone selective interlocking scheme to achieve, you know, fast tripping for the bus. So zone selective interlocking schemes for bus protection is the best is one of the best applications for the distribution world. Uh, another, the other thing that I was using Goose Message for back then was we had an automation scheme on the uh, high side of the transformer where we could sort of switch sources, and, and so that's very effective. As we look at like process bus in the distribution world, we open up a whole new world to distribution, and I think process bus has a, a has a good fit inside of distribution especially since uh, we're not doing a lot in distribution, and I think Process bus with centralized protection with a single device protecting multiple feeders and maybe even the transformer is one of the best applications that I've seen in distribution and for 61850 in general. Okay, so another question is, how is PRP uh, more applicable in the U.S. market? Uh, so PRP stands for Primary Redundancy Protocol. And because of my short time today and because this is sort of a primer, I didn't get to talk about some of the nuanced things, but one of the things that, um, one of the things that is somewhat important is that we have redundancy. And so, especially in the transmission world, we'll have redundancy in the IEDs, but we'll probably also want redundancy inside of the network. And so the best way to achieve redundancy inside of our network, either on station bus or process bus, and I'm giving my opinion, but when I say the best way, so be forewarned with the caveat that I'm giving my opinion, is primary redundancy protocol. And primary redundancy protocol is a way that we can send, um, is a way that we can send <clears throat> Or it's a way that we can send messages over to redundant networks, so there's no failover time. Okay, so here's a question. Why has fixed goose been removed, and will it come back? And that's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so I'm thinking, I'm assuming that this question is referring to 
in after firmware seven dot two of the UR relay, we did not have something called fixed goose. So if you have any firmware less than seven dot seven dot two or less, we had something called fixed goose. And what fixed goose was is fixed goose was a mechanism that uh, that allowed well fixed goose was UCA goose. So the goose messages that I was uh, that I was sending in uh, the you know the year 2000 that was fixed goose. Um, it's UCA goose and it's called reason it's called fixed goose is because it has a fixed data set length. It also it, it, it was an easier way to to it, it, it was not really as interoperable. The only manufacturer that implemented UCA goose or fixed goose was GE. Um, so that's sort of the reason that you don't find it in 7.3. Uh, we do have a lot of customers that have, that are using fixed goose messages in some of those older firmwares, and um, we are looking at adding it back in the future at some point. I don't know when, and I can't make promises, but we are looking at that. Um, I think I've got time for one more question. Okay, so here's a question. How does one map Goose to SCADA if it cannot get routed? And so that's a really good question. I, I did spend a lot of time talking about the MMS protocol. The MMS protocol is the client server protocol. and that's the protocol that you really should use for your SCADA applications. With the SCADA gateway or a local substation HMI being the client to the IEDs being the server. Uh, Goose messaging is really meant to be a very fast mechanism to get a message from one IED to another IED. So it's not really meant to be the mechanism that we're going to send messages to SCADA. We could, but in my opinion, again, we're talking about my opinion, the better mechanism for SCADA is MMS. Yeah, somebody asked what a newspaper was. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, yeah, maybe at some point I will have to explain what newspaper papers are. Uh, okay. Here's another good question. Uh, can you please elaborate on SCL, various language format for substation configuration? So SCL, again, that stands for Substation Configuration Language. Uh, part of that standard says that, that, the, that the, um, the IEDs will, you can set them, you can describe them with an XML file. And, and an XML is a, is a standard file format. There are typically several different uh, several different formats for the devices. So one of the formats is a ICD file. So ICD stands for ID Capable, uh, Capability uh, Description. So it describes the capabilities of the IED. So this is sort of an unset settings file, basically, or unset as the relay as the device is unset. CID stands for configured IED, and so a CID is all the settings inside of the IED. And then there are things like um, an SCD, and, and basically the way that this is meant. The, the way these tools are meant to be used is that I can take a CID file from the relay and I can con use a, um, a tool to configure my entire substation. And that tool will spit out a file called an SCD file. So that's a substation configured description. And I can take that SCD file and then export the CID functions back into my IEDs to actually set the, the, the relay. So I think I'm 
out of time, before I yield the floor back to Colleen, I, I will say that I do have a lot of questions that I've left unanswered, and so hopefully we can get those answered uh, via a follow-up email. But with that said, Colleen, do you have any closing remarks for us? Well, I do want to thank you, Terry, and I want to thank everyone for attending today. This concludes today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you again at our February Tech Talk. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.